Thank you very much. Very kind. Thank you. Um, I always do a preamble before the main speech. Did you see George Brown on the, on the, on the banner? One of my favorite politicians. Um, a, a good Social Democrat and a founder member of the Social De Democratic Party, but he liked to drink. And uh, there's, there's a funny story about George Brown. When he was Foreign Secretary in the 60s, he, uh, he did a trip to South America and uh, he attended an official reception a little bit worse for wear. He walked up to a, a, a vision, this tall vision in red, and said, would you do me the honor of the next dance? The person responded, I won't dance with you for three reasons. First, you're drunk. Second, this isn't a waltz. It's the Peruvian national anthem. <laughs> Third, I'm the Archbishop of Lima. Legend. <laughs> Chair, conference, fellow Social Democrats. It's good to be in Manchester, which is the first industrial city. It can't go on like this. We, we chose that strap line partly because it's a line in the film with Nail and I, but mainly because it's true. It can't go on like this. Uh, I'm going to talk about three things today. Uh, where we are, how we got here, and how to solve it. So first, where we are. You need to brace yourselves, because this is going to be challenging. The government hasn't balanced its budget in over 20 years. This year, we will borrow over 200,000 million. The national debt now stands at 2,388,000 million, which is the highest ever. Global debt is higher today than it was during the financial crisis. We are addicted to a drug called debt. We haven't had a positive balance of goods, uh, a, a trade in goods since 1985, and no one will talk about it, not least the people that caused it. We save too little, we invest too little, we produce too little, but we consume too much, particularly on imports. And look at those imports many of them from factories involving slave labor. Household debt is rampant and the use of food banks common. And yet a quarter of all food is wasted in the home and about 9% before it leaves the farm gate. Our rivers are polluted with sewage, our fields degraded with nitrates, our seas are overfished. And yet we can't even begin to feed ourselves. Meanwhile, back in the city, there's an epidemic of knife crime, and no one will be honest about the cause, which is family breakdown. We have a young generation renting, not owning, denied a house to start a family, their wages siphoned off each month in high rents. This is met with silence by the so-called so uh, conservatives that govern us. These people can't even control the national border. We have aircraft carriers costing billions, but thousands of illegal crossings in the channel. I had no idea Albania was so unsafe. I'm unaware of any nation in history that survived very long without a border. But this is an experiment the Tories seem determined to try. As Sergeant Wilson might say, is that terribly wise? We have a massive, unsustainable Ponzi scheme, otherwise known as the University uh, Industrial Complex, which creates millions of pounds in debt, most of which will never be repaid. Vice chancellors get rich, but under their noses, free speech and freedom of thought and inquiry is dying in the academy. And back in the real world, there's a shortage of doctors, engineers, plumbers and builders, because no one can be bothered to train them. It's easier to rely on immigration. And after inventing civil nuclear power in the 50s, our government pathetically begs the French and Chinese to build power stations for them, in the same way that we ask foreign states to run our railways. Shameful. Do they honestly believe the French would return the favor? Said them on fire. In sum, We've lived off debt for 40 years, but that's about to stop 
because the era of cheap money is over. And the added problem for Europe is that the era of cheap energy is probably over too. I think the unserious people that got us here should be run out of office. The, the question is, who, who replaces them? How do we get here? I'm going to put a flag in the ground. I think the root of our problems are cultural, most of them. Bad ideas, bad ideology, short-termism, unseriousness. Basically, the hallmarks of runaway liberalism, which are an obsession with rights over responsibilities, a preference for the global over the familiar, and of other people's culture over your own. The loss of a life in common and of social solidarity, the elevation of personal feelings over empirical facts, the racialization of everything, putting differences above what unites us, the deification of the free market, an indifference to what is made where and by whom, and a stubborn refusal to plan, in fact, a demonization of planning in general. The result is debt, inequality, and division. And Liz Truss is basically, I think, the death spasm of that type of thinking. And it's got to go. But as Epicurus might cons console us, it will be painful, but it will pass. You'll find no better example of bad ideology than in housing. It was Tawney who said, the solutions to our problems are rejected not because they're difficult, but because they are simple. I think that's brilliant. He's right. The cause of the housing crisis is simple. It's the deliberate destruction of state sector capacity in house building combined with large-scale immigration. That's it. You don't need to know any more than that. And the solution is to correct both. But ideology prevents the great minds who govern us from grasping this. Consequently, we spend about 17 billion on, on housing benefit a year dealing with the symptoms, and we spend about 9 billion building houses. That's how bad it is. Madness. Ideology of this kind has destroyed something else, the Brexit coalition. I think that's, that's over. The libertarian right had only one idea for a sort of post-Brexit world, and that idea was unfettered free trade, unilateral free trade. And I think nothing is more likely to destroy this country than that. A good example of this type of thinking is Liz Truss's trade deal of last year. Any good? If it was so, it might be. If it were so, it would be. But as it isn't, it ain't. It is not a good deal. I just want to run through it. Last year, Japan exported goods worth 7,422,000,000 000 to the UK. We exported 5,954,000,000 to Japan. We have a bilateral trade deficit with Japan of 1.4 billion. Truss's trade deal is predicted to increase Japan's long-run exports to us by 80%, but ours to them by only 17%. Question, can Liz do maths? <laughs> I'm not sure, I mean, I know the Chancellor struggles, but the, the point is that this trade deficit is gonna get a lot bigger. And as Peter Shaw once said, you can't go on borrowing that. A surer way you will not find of getting poorer. And it's very odd because libertarians, free trade purists, see a, a trade deficit as, as, as a badge of honor almost. It's like a, a crack addict. Uh, scoring another fix and, and boasting about it. My point is that if Liz Trust thinks the Japan deal is good, I just wonder what uh, a, a, a bad one looks like. Shocking. I think this is childlike, empty, cargo cult Thatcherism, and it's got to go. Let, let me turn to another cultural pathology, which is anti-Britishness. The loss of the Queen last month made us ponder the span of her reign. One reflection, despite her efforts, is that we are a more divided society today 
than when she started. And isn't it curious that so many of our cultural leaders denigrate this country? An example, Tom Daly, the Olympian, made a BBC film about homophobia in the Commonwealth, and it is a problem. Pakistan and Nigeria are not at the vanguard of gay rights. The cause of all this hatred, he asks? A British law from 1923. That, in a tight field, that, that's probably the silliest thing the BBC has ever put out. Probably, probably sillier than the Ministry of Silly Walks. But the point is that someone has to be blamed, and it must be the British. It's crazy. I've no doubt, actually, that, that Tom Daly is sincere. But he's an expert in, in, in jumping off a plank into water. He's not an expert in why, why, why Nigeria hasn't had its own Wolfenden report. Not at all. I want to raise the issue of short-termism, because I think that's at the heart of a lot of our problems. The, the tendency to constantly take easier, immediate options in preference to long-term rewards. This is very, very costly. Uh, and an example, you won't get a better example probably of this, uh, 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 is sh UK energy policy. Um, we face an energy crisis which our rulers failed to anticipate or prepare for. And the proximate cause is uh, Russia's reprehensible and self-defeating invasion of Ukraine. But we need, to little, we need to dig a little bit deeper than that. Um, we used to build nuclear power stations in this country, and we stopped. The Tories closed down British nuclear fuels in 2010. And just a few years later, they were chatting up the Chinese Communist Party and the French to do the job for them. What would Clem Attlee think of that? What would he think? He'd be appalled. I think if you don't care who produces our power or who runs our railways, you're not fit to run this country. And the real tragedy is that we, we now don't have the base load we need and that the lights could go off this, this winter. It's possible. Truss's energy bailout, which is necessary, will cost about $200 billion. Uh, But if we'd invested that in nuclear power, you could have provided about 70% of our energy needs, our electricity needs with that. And you'd have cut carbon emissions too. I, I don't... I don't despise the Tories. I, I actually despair of them. It's different. <laughs> We're living through industrial decline caused by cultural decline. You can't have an industrial economy without affordable energy. And Labour and the Tories wanted neither. So stuck they are in the grooves of decline. But my real point is that the decline doesn't consist in not building the nuclear power stations. The decline consists in not wanting to. That's the point, it's different. In reality, Labour and the Tories have stripped away any sense of common purpose, and we need to get it back. And isn't it interesting that Starmer's Labour Party actively object to common ownership of our utilities? Staggering. What is the Labour Party for? Starmer, Starmer is like, like the woodcutter without an axe to grind, even for cutting wood. And Eddie Dempsey's right, by the way. Labour has been taken over by the Liberals entirely. The next thing I want to cover is unseriousness, which you see everywhere. The NHS is always under strain, uh, but few consider the demands that we put on it. True, it, it possibly does too much. Thank goodness that the Tavistock Clinic is closed and isn't still maiming children. Um, but but in, in reality, the, the NHS is a national sickness service because we are increasingly ill. One in three Britons is overweight uh, and suffering from diabetes or pre-diabetes, a condition which consumes about 10% of the NHS budget. And in some areas, a third of... Uh, children starting primary school are, are overweight or obese. Supermarket shelves are as stacked with junk food as the streets are with scooters delivering it. And the government response? It was going to ban 
two for one deals on Mars bars. That's about it. But it's not now. It's pathetic. We've got to do better than this. We've got to do better. If you see anything that's not quite right, see it, say it, sort it. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? Yeah. I've seen something that's not quite right on the south coast, something that feels a little bit odd. Thousands of young men arriving in boats, uninvited, unvetted, and unchecked. And I think you'd have to be blind or a liberal democrat <laughs> not to see that as an invasion. It's an invasion which is now costing us about five billion a year and over 40,000 pounds for each migrant. You could, you, could send, you could send them to Oxford University for that, cheaper. Quote, you cannot live with people upping sticks and just moving across national boundaries because they think they've got better prospects of a richer and healthier life there. That was David Owen about a year ago in an interview. He's right. In truth, the government doesn't want to secure the border. The Rwanda plan is a publicity stunt. And if it weren't, they wouldn't have left the legal means in place to undermine it. This is very, very dangerous. Without a border, the social contract falls. Sharing will collapse, and you'll end up with the type of clannishness that you see in failed states. Historians will reflect that those that had the most to lose did the least to prevent it. One, one further quote on immigration. Our new system gives us real control over who is coming in. Anyone? No. Conservative Party Manifesto 2019. I think it's time for some solutions, isn't it? We've had enough of this. Uh, how do we solve these problems? Humbly, I'm going to put forward uh, eight suggestions. First, start by supporting the family, which is the foundation of society. And be honest. Be honest that for children and society, on all the data, the best model is the traditional family. SDP policy, couples raising children together should benefit from full sharing of tax allowances. That will give parents more time to spend with their children, which is precious. You can't have the family farm if you don't have the family. That's Chesterton. It's, very, it's, it's apparently quite controversial. Now to, <laughs> Quote Chester, and I don't know. It's, it's too late for me. I've been doing it for years. Um, and on the family, you can't be pro-family and object when workers ask for a wage that's fit to support a family. You can't have it both ways. And, the, <laughs> and the, there's, a reason, there's a reason the RMT are on strike today. They haven't had a pay rise in three years. We should support them. Um, second, face up to the housing crisis. Solve it, and you start to deal with the cost of living crisis. Expensive housing is not socially useful. It's harmful. The solution is to end mass immigration and get the state back into the business of building homes. It is that simple, or at least it is that simple if your mind isn't addled with ideology. I... I asked, I asked the SDP policy team for three ingredients to solve or help solve the housing crisis, and I got them. The three are new entities to build the houses, powers to assemble the sites, and money to build them by taxing planning gain, which is the uplift in land value after planning permission has been granted. Uh, to be fair, it is a very radical policy. It's probably to the left of what Corbyn was... <coughs> proposing, but it's necessary, and it, but it will upset some people. You will, uh, unfortunately, have fewer yachts and fewer Lamborghinis, but it's a price we're prepared to pay. Um, <clears throat> Third, rebuild our manufacturing base, the foundation of our towns and cities. In the 60s and 70s, you could raise a family on uh, a family of four on a weekly wage of 40 hours. That's four on 40, and you can't do that anymore. And no, you don't get growth by magic, by cutting tax and wishing it. It doesn't happen that way. I mean, I, I wish I played for QPR, but you don't always get what you want. No, you need a plan. You need an industrial policy. <clears throat> Back British manufacturing in every department of state. Um, 
buy, buy British products, reshore industry, and plan a program of targeted import substitution. We must make, buy, and sell more in the UK, and we can do it if we want to. And adopt a sensible trade policy with tariffs to pr protect key industries. And again, tariffs, if you even mention the word tariff, you get accused of wanting to run some sort of Benite siege economy, or, <clears throat> or you get accused of, of starting a trade war. My point on that is that we, we're in a trade war. We're in a trade war every single second of every minute, of every hour of every day. So you could hardly do worse. Fourth, return the utilities, the natural monopolies, to public ownership. Scottish water is publicly owned. And when I'm in Scotland, uh, it, it's not obvious to me that things would be better if you got a merchant bank and loaded that with, with lots of debt, or if you had to pay dividends to foreigners. It's not, not, not obvious to me that that's the case, not at all. Fifth, reform the voting system. Nothing cause, causes short-termism more than first past the post. Labour and the Tories can hardly think past this week's headlines, let alone beyond a parliamentary term. They can't solve the problem because they are the problem. They're a symptom, not a cause. Sixth, get a grip of the national border. Adopt SDP policy on overseas detention and do that and the crossings would stop overnight. Then you could concentrate on more deserving cases like women and children in refugee camps. And always remember on this, we're not actually asking for very much. We have a right to a secure border. As John Howard once said in Australia, we will decide who enters this country and the circumstances in which they come. He was right. Seventh, get serious on animal rights and the environment. No one else will. Get control of our territorial waters and introduce a maritime environmental policy which leaves parts of the sea wilderness. And this will allow fish stocks to recover and seed neighbouring zones. And build a British trawler fleet as well, so you might have some influence on what happens in your own waters. <clears throat> and finally, get sensible on labour market planning, starting with the NHS. If you only train half the doctors and nurses you need, you run into trouble. <clears throat> and get serious about the causes of ill health, the demand side. <clears throat> Here's a cost-free measure. Start a fitness regime in schools of one hour compulsory exercise per day. Ban sweets, ban packed lunches, and offer good free school meals instead. And also get, get children to drink something called water. People will say you can't do that. Of course, you'd be very foolish not to. In sum, the answer to bad ideology is good sense. The solution to unseriousness is to get serious. <clears throat> and the cure to short-termism is long-termism. Have a plan. Before I finish, I want to say some thank yous. Uh, I want to thank Valerie Gray, uh, my chairman, and Robert, my uh, party secretary, and the rest of my colleagues on the NCC for all the work they do. I also want to uh, thank all candidates and campaigners and regional organisers the SDP, and a special thank you to the North West Party for putting on this conference. And thank you all for being here today. <clears throat> and, and special thanks to Dave Bettany, who made huge strides in the, uh, as our candidate in the South Yorkshire mayoral election, getting 10,177 votes and breaking the 5% barrier in Rotherham, Barnsley, and Doncaster. Well done. <clears throat> a few years ago, a young man stood for election in Leeds, and he got a few hundred votes. Labour beat him, they got thousands. Now, most people would have given up at that point. But Wayne Dixon isn't most people. And the SDP isn't like most parties. We fought and fought until that Labour majority was reduced from thousands 
to hundreds. And this year, the dam broke. We took the seat from Labour in a landslide, getting more votes than all the other parties put together. A landslide. <clears throat> A landslide that the Yorkshire Post uh, described as one of the most shocking election results Leeds has ever seen. Except it wasn't shocking. It was, it was what happens if you have clear principles, if you work hard and you never give up, and in particular, if you offer the public something decent to vote for. <clears throat> it, was, it, was, it was an overnight success which was five years in the making. And let, let me tell you that there weren't too many dry eyes that day, myself included. And there's also quite a good video. Uh, um, some may think it a small victory, but, but 32,000 people in Leeds now have a first-rate SDP councillor. And when I walk down Middleton Park Avenue now, I'm in SDP territory, and that's, that's a wonderful feeling. Um, people... People, people put their trust in us, and we will repay it. Cleaning, cleaning signs, mending roads, setting up markets, getting clubs started. You could build a civilization on what Wayne's doing there. <clears throat> and I, I, I want to just mention something, because Wayne did his, um, his maiden speech in Leeds City Hall the other day, and he mentioned it was about the Queen, and I'm quoting him. <clears throat> he said, I think the Queen's sense of duty was one of the reasons for her long and happy life. A life lived for others is a life well lived. I think he's right. Beautiful sentiment. <clears throat> and and now, now Wayne is joined by Councillor Richard Bright from Derbyshire. Welcome, Richard. <clears throat> what happened in Leeds can happen nationally, but it's vital to understand what we're doing. The SDP in the 80s started at the top and worked its way down. We're actually doing exactly the opposite, and it takes time. Labour took 24 years to get into government. Under Joe Grimmond, the post-war Liberals took 20 years to re-establish themselves on the national stage, and the Greens and UKIP took a similar time. I think we can do it more quickly, but there are staging posts, and the next staging post for us is the general election uh, which may be next year or the year after. We need candidates in every region. Our aim is clear, which is the best SDP result since 87. And I've always been realistic with you, but I know we can do that. Yes, it is a long march, uh, but we will get there. Why? Because there's a lot to love about the SDP. Our history, the strength of our philosophical foundations, our loyalty to each other, even in foul weather. The fact that Rod Little says that the sound of red wine being poured into a glass is the sound of the SDP. <laughs> um, but most of all, most of all, it's because our offer is unique. A party that defends free speech knows what a woman is, but also knows what a national housing program is, what industry is, what animal rights are, and what a national border is. A party, in other words, which is serious. That's a very, very powerful combination. And no one else can offer it. No other party has left-leaning economics and respect for tradition. And frankly, we are more social than Labour. But we would, we would conserve far more than the Tories. That's the The, these are challenging times for the country we love, and I have an uncomfortable feeling that Liz Truss will not be leading us to the border of heaven. People want something better, and they'll find it in the SDP. We've proved we can win. My advice, keep going and win again. Thank you.